You're listening to All Things 3D, where we talk about the world of fabricating, designing, and capturing in the third dimension. Good afternoon, everybody. Hi, this is Mike Balzer from All Things 3D, and this is 3D in Review for August 24, 2018. So what you saw before were a couple of videos uh, demonstrating my about $500 uh, AR headset. As you can see there, it's a, a prototype. I showed some images last week, but I've kind of uh, cleaned it up a little bit, modified it, um, put on a, a bracket on the back, one of the ratchet type, to make it a little more secure. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the components that I used to make this, and if you wanted to go out and, and try it yourself, um, most of the components you can buy. There is one component, however, that's still not available uh, in any quantity, and uh, hopefully that will change soon. But uh, let's kind of go right into it. Uh, I wanted to show um, well, actually, this is the unit here, and essentially it consists of three components, a uh, OEM uh, AR headset uh, that's normally used for uh, smartphones. Uh, that's what the slot is, um, but I've replaced it with a uh, 2560 by 1440 uh, LCD panel from a company called Top Foison. Uh, they're a Chinese company. And then, uh, obviously, the, actually, as I call the secret sauce, is the occipital core structure, uh, which is not available. Uh, it is available to the developers um, and OEMs, um, but hopefully they'll make a decision to actually sell it. And I'll explain in a little bit uh, why this is important and how this all functions. So first, um, let's kind of go out through the different websites that we can see on each of the components. And then we'll come back and actually uh, run a little bit of a test so that you can see it for yourself. Okay, so let's head out to the uh, top foison first. Um, like I said, they're a Chinese company, and I have been in conversation for some time. They not only make uh, large, uh, as they call it, VR panels, uh, but they also make uh, smaller panels as well. And I think they also have a 3.8-inch AMOLED panel, which you could possibly use, but what I found very interesting about this panel is the uh, HDMI to MIPI adapter, uh, which, as you can see there, is basically custom fit, and you can, and I think there was an adhesive on the back, or maybe I put one on it, uh, and uh, um, basically adhered it to the back of the panel itself, uh, which has an aluminum backing, so it's fairly... Uh, uh, what would you call it? Durable, obviously. In a later iteration, I would probably make a support case to provide more protection. But almost out of the, the box, it's ready to go. And uh, they don't have other images. Now, this particular version here that you see in this image, yeah, they don't uh, break it down any further, um, is essentially HDMI with MIPI, but they also have what they call a U-shaped version that includes an MPU, and I don't know the specifics yet. I've asked about it. But for our case here, using the structure core, uh, that isn't really required. The IMU is built into it and uh, would not be required in order to... Uh, uh, on this particular... So you'll save yourself a little bit of money. So I've been able to go out to, like... Um, Alibaba and get this in quantities of 1 through 10 of about $88, $90, uh, maybe a little bit more than that. Um, obviously, as the volume increases, um, you can get it uh, a little bit cheaper than that. 
Uh, so I think when I originally bought this, it was about $200, $250. So it has come down. So it's something to look at. In fact, you may not be able to buy it on AliExpress for less than $200. So clearly that would drive the cost up. But uh, for about 100 which is what I've used to quote the keeping this thing under 500 and I'll explain where the, the main cost is. So the next thing you need is some type of housing. Now, as you know, with the uh, Leap Motion, they have a system uh, about actually creating um, this convex semi-mirrored structures that are required in order for the light or for us to still see through it because it's semi-transparent with a semi-mirrored finish, but we also want to be able to reflect the display. And in the case of the uh, Leap Motion uh, open source system, it was essentially two panels that projected from the sides into uh, the lenses. This one essentially projects the phone directly into it. Now the problem with this, this particular design here, is that there really isn't any access to the cameras, so you couldn't use ARKit or AR Core in order to be able to view your system. Um, but the cool thing is you can go out there, they have downloads for the SDK, and this particular version here is their um, uh, HR Box 2, uh, which is a different design than their previous. Uh, they've gone to more of a, a strap instead of an elastic band, which I think is nice, but the fact is that if you're going to be using it uh, on a repeated occasion, uh, you're going to have to be able to hold it and then put the straps tighter. They've also changed the lens out. Uh, if you look at the one that I have here, these are kind of a bluish tint. They've gone to a smoky gray uh, semi-mirrored, and I think if I remember correctly, they told me that it was had a little bit more transparency. Uh, uh, but uh, with that being the case, the reason why you have these convex lenses here is that it helps magnify the images on the screen. Now keep in mind, this screen that I was talking about previously is a 6 inch or 5.8 inch, uh, 25, 25, 60 by 1440 pixels, so they're extremely tiny. Uh, so to be able to view them correctly in front of you, there's a slight magnification. Um, but we'll find out later on that that can be a problem because you have to distort the image, which means you have to undistort it or distort it the same amount in your video projection uh, from Unity or whatever. They actually provide a Unity plugin with shader to compensate for. But there are some peculiarities that I've been talking to them about um, as far as uh, that distortion not always uh, being absolved if you rotate your head dramatically. But if you're gazing forward, moving left to right, I found that the image quality distortion was minimal. So then finally, our last item is the structure core itself. Now this has been, as if you've been watching the show uh, regularly, this has been something that has been uh, announced and uh, I guess is available if you want to sign up for the developer kit. The problem is the developer kit on this is uh, $5,000 and then an additional $1,000 for units. So obviously it's extremely expensive. So the the goal would be to, uh, and then you are right now require a $500 uh, deposit. So to me, uh, they haven't really gone full volume, but in my conversations, because I am thinking of possibly utilizing this as a, a device uh, is, um, probably in the price range of about 350 very similar to their structure sensor, maybe a little bit more. But if you look at other camera systems that have the IMU built into them, they're about $300 all the way up to about $500, depending what you're looking at. And normally they're stereo cameras. The cool thing about this, this includes two stereo infrared cameras, which are the two outside, a wide angle um, RGB camera. Actually, I think it's a black and white camera in the middle and then the actual structured light uh, emission device, which is like the dot pattern used in the iPhone 10 or a, the Connect One, a slew of products now that are available on a very small compact chassis that also provides heat sinking. So uh, as you can see in the design, and I'll jump back to my own screen, um, 
As you can see, I've designed a case for it with some ventilation on top, but other than that, it maintains a fairly uh, decent uh, temperature range, and more importantly, it works really nicely, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, so they have obviously made lots of progress. I've had an opportunity to work with their uh, alpha version of their Windows SDK, uh, which currently provides only positional tracking, but in the future it will provide all the features of the bridge engine um, in a Windows package. And uh, essentially I have three cables. Uh, two of them could be combined, and actually, actually three if I put in a USB-C multiplexer. The actual core uses a USB-C connection. Uh, whereas the uh, Tope Fusion uses a micro SD to provide power only, and uh, the HDMI, which is a HDMI mini. So in my my design here or K interface, I basically took a cable from one of my older um, uh, headsets, tore it apart. So I've salvaged the cable, so that provided my HDMI and my, my micro USB, um, but it's a standard micro USB that I had to put an adapter on it. Uh, clearly, that would have to be uh, changed to a micro, or excuse me, a mini uh, HDMI. Uh, but they also provide an audio jack that works off of the HDMI audio, and I have used it, and it works pretty good. So essentially, you have an audio capability as well as all the interfaces in that particular card. So clearly, they had uh, made this to work uh, in an, a, a headset or a, a VR-type device. I don't think they had thought about it from a AR perspective, but as you saw in the previous two videos, I think it works fairly well. The only disappointment, and again, is that the backlighting, since it's an LCD, an IPS LCD, um, gives you kind of a, a gray instead of a full black. Clearly an AMOLED screen would be superior, uh, or it's, uh, some of these newer twisted Matics. But uh, for the cost, let's say $100 for this panel, uh, obviously that is one of the disadvantages you could probably live with. Now clearly if you wanted to add more money into this and find a panel uh, that is AMOLED from 5.5 to 6 inches at 25 by 60, you could go in that direction. And some of you who might have your old uh, DK2 from Oculus, tear it apart because there's a nice uh, 1080p AMOLED screen in that that could be used and it also has an IMU so even if you didn't have the positional tracking you could still put it to use uh, in this particular headset. So you could work with it that way. So I'm getting an error. So I'm going to go ahead and give the test now. Otherwise, uh, my system will die and then we'll have problems. So right, here, let me jump back into my screen. Where are we at? Okay. So let's see. I should be able to reset it and get a screen. Maybe not because no, nothing ever works for me. Okay, well, let's see if I can bring it back up. So give me a moment here. Now that it's frozen on me. Oh, there we go. All right, so you should see it. And it just went away. Well, it appears my battery died. Well, that was disappointing. All right, I'll come back to it later on, but uh, essentially this is what you can get out of it. So I'll go ahead and bring it back up again. Now, this is obviously using a smartphone uh, inside the, uh, the lens system here and basically moving it around. And uh, here's another example. And the reason why we see the translucency in the image is because it's blacked out. And many AR systems, HoloLens, as well as the new Magic Leap, work in a very similar uh, process. As you can see, as I'm moving around, uh, the reason why the, the movement isn't smooth is because I'm shifting, because I have a lot of stuff uh, in that particular area that I uh, work in. Uh, but as you can see, it's effective. I have full rotational and positional. And as mentioned, in the future, we'll have uh, full um, plane as well as anchoring capability and other uh, features of the bridge engine. Uh, okay, so let me jump back to my main screen. 
And then uh, we'll jump back out to the desktop again. So again, let me put this off to the side. So again, a lot of the magic comes from this depth sensor they've created. And what makes it unique is that it includes all of the, uh, the projectors, cameras, and the IMU. So literally, all you need is a panel and uh, some type of headset. So again, this could be used for VR as well. And uh, what's funny is when I get into talking about the Magic Leap, a lot of this uh, capability, both the HoloLens and all this, use some similar type of projection system and cameras uh, in order to provide the positional tracking. Uh, the nice thing is this is all included in one package. Um, however, there is no date when this would be available, but I am looking at uh, possibly putting together my own headset or making an optional kit based upon this uh, as soon as they uh, develop more in their Windows kit so that we could use it possibly in the small headset that I've talked about for $500. Or if you've got a Dream World, um, what is it called, the Dream Glass, uh, which is some people call the meta knockoff, but obviously it was one of the original founders uh, or somebody that worked with them that went off to build their own that I've been in discussions with uh, who has hand tracking but doesn't have positional tracking. So this could be included in that. Uh, so I'm looking at uh, providing a case and structure system, no pun intended, uh, to allow this uh, to be added for about three to three hundred and fifty dollars uh, to any type of device so um, keep uh, tuned up and we'll see uh, later on when that actually becomes available um, but uh, so far I've been very pleased with the results uh, processing times a little high but uh, that should come down in the future as we see more and more iterations uh, of this also keep in mind as they show here this uh, structure sensor SDK uh, will be available on other systems, Mac OS, iOS, Android, Linux, as well as Windows. Uh, so we're going to see a full complement of uh, what do you call libraries that are available to use uh, the structure core. And there are a couple of other products out there that I think there's a robot out of Colorado that's using this. Um, so we're going to see more things from it. And uh, I will keep you abreast on my development with it, as well as occipitals uh, as it becomes more and more available. Okay, so let's move on into our first item. Uh, let's see, is that the one I want to cover first? Yeah, it's the iFix that uh, teardown. And if you're like me, you love what iFix it does because they spend their money and they tear these things down. And uh, for the most part, I don't have to tear down my units. I have had to do that occasionally, but keep in mind, once they normally tear these down, they normally don't go back together. Um, so there's a nice little video, and I will just jump right in the middle of one. Um, and as you hear, they see in this video here, they're actually tearing it apart. And here they're showing the, the projection system within the, uh, the lenses. And I'll just turn that all the way down. And so a, f a full, complete video and breakdown, but I won't take any more of their time. Uh, you can go out and uh, watch the video and obviously give them a click and thumbs up for it. But let's go through all the steps on this particular device, and then I have a few PDFs to go through. Uh, one thing, as we already know, is all the computer uh, what do you want to call it? Specifications, uh, which they also confirm. Uh, the fact is that they're using an NVIDIA Tegra TX2, uh, is, or actually they call it X2, but it's a Tegra X2, is uh, a, a big thumbs up for them. I think that's one of the better processors. Uh, I'm a little disappointed because I had worked probably pretty hard to try and obtain uh, the TX2, and there's probably a reason why we didn't see the Magic Leap actually being delivered until now because volume of TX2 chips was probably a little difficult to come by. Um, but the fact that it is in here, and then they actually break it down and show some of the things in order to keep it cool, as well as the, uh, the ancillary chips that are involved with it. So as they discussed, the, the big thing was these lenses. And there's a few um, articles, and I'm going to kind of jump into it, because you can go out there and read this yourself. Let's see, we'll kind of go here, and they talk about the magnetic system that they use for the Six Degrees of Freedom handset. Uh, 
I just think that I could play a prank on somebody because clearly uh, if they're only looking at a multi-axis magnetic field, I could come up there with a rare, strong air, rare earth, excuse me, rare earth ma uh, magnet and create some devious type situations for the person who's using it. Uh, the other thing that would be kind of scary is that uh, if you're familiar with TV sets or the old CRT type, running a magnet over the top of it um, really messes up the alignment coils. And uh, I'm thinking that possibly putting a, a rare earth magnet on this probably would do the same thing, even though they talk about some copper um, sprayed, uh, what do you want to call it, electro uh, shielding in here. I don't think that would be enough to compensate for it. But again, I don't actually have a magic leap not really wanting to spend $2,400 on one. But, uh, yeah, it would be interesting to see what would happen with a strong magnet uh, close to this uh, the detection coil. So on to the actual uh, system here. As many people out there uh, kind of envisioned, it would be some type of LCOS um, system. Uh, and uh, then they talk about this... Uh, these what they call holographic grates, and then the waveguides. Uh, as mentioned, there appears to be six of them, and uh, and basically, as we have seen in a lot of the videos and uh, demonstrations, there is a a front focused um, plane as well as a back focused plane uh, to provide uh, stability to focus from near objects to far objects. Many people did not feel that the effect was dramatic enough to really notice. Um, however, Tested did a great uh, review of it and did say that they did notice something, but they felt that the transition from one to the other was uh, kind of abrupt, or you, at least you could delineate uh, the positioning of from one to the other, which would make sense because you don't have any gradations between it. Um, but the other thing I thought about, if you're looking at this illustration here, is if you have multiple objects in the scene, um, let's say one in the foreground, one in the background, uh, you would have to have these panels always activated. So I thought, how are we doing this? And then I did a little research, but before I get ahead of myself, let's kind of run directly into this article by Kaur Gultag. I hope that's the way his name is pronounced, um, who does... Uh, several articles. He seems to have a, an engineering background in this type of thing. And then wrote about separating the magic and reality. So it's a great read, uh, but basically he had come to this conclusion early before it was actually released that it was going to be some type of uh, LCOS system to drive uh, these waveguides, and it appears he's correct. In fact, I don't even know if he identifies, but he also talks about some of the effects seen in some of the videos, um, like ghosting or an aura around objects as being a cause of using these type of waveguides. Um, so he basically is right on. In fact, he, he brings up one of the patents, uh, which I also have in one of the PDFs that I'll bring up shortly, um, that talk about how this is all done. And here we see the LCOS system and then from the previous block diagram. And uh, something that I came to the conclusion after seeing this is, as you can see here, we have basically two sets of RGB, one for the foreground um, plane as well as one or three RGB for the rear plane, all going through one LCOS type uh, panel here. And, uh, you know, I thought, well, how are they going about doing this? How are they switching it in, in order to keep this indicated in the Unity uh, SDK uh, 60 frames per second? Uh, but then I realized that uh, each of the image uh, planes are only, what do they say, uh, I have it somewhere, 1280 by 940 or something like that. So that would work in hand with uh, some of this, uh, the manufacturer who makes this LCOS uh, range where you could go either 1080p at uh, 60 frames per second or 720 at 120, which makes a lot of sense. If you're going 120, clearly we could uh, essentially run two frames in there. But there's also something else that I found very interesting. And uh, so instead of going, I'm going to go into the PDFs now. 
and instead of looking at this, and clearly it's a lot of information, uh, it's in the links in the iFixit article, and it will be in my links as well. Uh, it's a good read. It gives you a much better understanding of what they were moving towards, and it's nice to compare, um, as Carl had mentioned, uh, what was magic, or not necessarily fabrication, but hopeful thinking versus uh, the reality of what's available from an engineering perspective. And with his experience in creating uh, very small uh, display systems, uh, clearly he would have a good understanding of what would be available and what would be kind of a fantasy. And so some of these processes here that they identified are clearly something that's going to be in the future. And I think it probably will not be for some time. Okay, but this is what I thought was cool. This is an actual uh, uh, PDF from the company Omnivision who makes the Lycos uh, panel that uh, and the iFixit believes that it's a custom. Um, I don't know about that. Uh, it seems to have all the specifications with it. Uh, but what uh, I thought was interesting is the ability for it to do six color fields. So one of the things that they discuss in the iFixit I article, plus you can read about it elsewhere, is the way Lycos works is they use uh, sequential frames, which means you show a whole color of red, you show a whole color of green, whole color of blue, and more than likely probably uh, all within uh, 60 uh, frames per, or 1 60th of a second. And uh, so that what does that come out to? I did it before. It's like one three sixty of a second if you're using all six planes. But if you have two sets of RGB, that would fulfill the color fields. Normally that's used, uh, from my understanding, um, in some projectors to provide deeper blacks and intermediate colors in order to provide the full color gamut. But here, if we just supported it with RGB and two sets of RGB, we could run through those color fields and just switch. And since they're all separated, uh, as mentioned in there by these, uh, um, these waveguides per color, uh, essentially, when you get to the outer RGB plane, it would just switch to that. So I think it would be very cool if that's actually what's going on here. Um, the iFixit article doesn't do a lot to kind of identify that. Uh, the other thing that would be pointed out is that this thing uh, at 720p can do 120 frames per second. So clearly, if they were not using the six color field, uh, they could switch frames uh, by clearly running uh, two sets at 60 frames, but what I thought about there at 1080p, boy, that's a massive amount of data when you consider running two, basically two 1080p, 1920 by 1920, which is 3840, which is like running one panel out of this uh, Pimax system. On both eyes, you're pushing a lot of uh, pixels through on on something that uh, Pimax is having a problem of using with a desktop, and we're asking the NVIDIA TX2 to handle that. So obviously there has been a lot of uh, minimization as far as uh, frame rate, um, pixels per um, uh, for each image, uh, in order to reduce it so that was is within the confines of the TX2, which may also explain why you're not seeing a lot of complicated object. You're still pushing a lot of data through here, and this again was the same issue that the HoloLens had and why some of their um, models were very simple uh, because, again, you're, you can't really push a lot of information on some of these mobiles, and if you've been dealing with mobile VR, you're already familiar with that, so you're going to see the same issues here. Uh, so again, I'm not really sure. Um, I'm hoping that they're using the six color fields that this thing can generate in a novel way by providing two RGB images, one foreground, one rear, uh, provide the two different focus planes. Uh, but again, unknown, And uh, but it would be kind of neat. Here they're only showing it with three RGBs, but again, with six of them, you could make gradients of RGB or just have two sets of them funneling them into their own specific waveguide. So, uh, who knows, but that's just my kind of idea. So again, you can go back and read the, the entire uh, patent for this. And then let's see, do I have something else? Oh, here's something else in it, but uh, I'm kind of leaping. Uh, one of the other things that helps in improving the performance of your vision processor 
or as they call it here, a vision processor, is taking some of the information from some of the positional sensors and uh, basically running them through a small CPU, crunching it, fusing the information, and providing, uh, like in this case, 3D depth, uh, a dominant information. So it's basically slam generation without having to do it on the CPU, which then obviously offloads it. This is something very similar what Qualcomm is doing uh, with the uh, Lenovo, uh, what is it, uh, Mirage Solo, as well as the HTC Vive Focus. Uh, they offload that uh, SLAM capability to this auxiliary chip, uh, which reduces the load on the processor itself. So it's cool that they're working with that uh, kind of functionality as well. And it's kind of, in fact, I don't know if they bought them. I'm trying to remember. This company was bought by somebody, but I can't think of it. So uh, cool on them for doing that. So obviously there's like a lot of great technology that's existing now that they used in order to make this happen. Um, so a lot of a lot of hats off to uh, Magic Leap from that perspective. The sad thing is why they had to push such uh, absurd marketing that showed things that really weren't going to happen. Uh, but clearly, from a technical perspective, this is about what you can obtain uh, currently. And yeah, I think they've done a good job. And uh, I really, again, hats off to iFixit for doing these great uh, little teardowns and going through and identifying components because it really helps to identify exactly uh, what the uh, patents are using based upon uh, the engineering um, hardware that's available and how they put it to use. And uh, so I'm not gonna spend more time with that. Clearly you may can dig through this as much as you want. Comment to me if you feel that uh, you've got a different idea of what's going on and uh, so on that note, uh, I'm going to move on. But, uh, you know, the only problem is finding $2,000 to buy one of these. And uh, clearly uh, it would be kind of fun to compare it to my own little $500 unit. Um, so if you join me late here, uh, it almost had a demo, but my laptop, I tried to, to get it in before the laptop battery died, but I would, did not succeed with it. Uh, but essentially... The, I'll show a little demo here if you come in late. Uh, so essentially this is basically a smartphone held up to the, uh, the lens system and with the positional tracking I'm able to move around uh, my little Vince character and uh, it works pretty good. Um, it's still in its infancy um, but the fact is that it really has a fairly wide field of view. Uh, the object is pretty solid. Uh, both the company who makes uh, the headset, which I'll jump through again. Uh, this company has a newer version out. Um, if you write to them, you can probably get a, a developer's version f uh, for a sample version for about $30. Uh, I've seen this on Amazon for about $60. Don't know if it's worth $60. Um, but uh, they have a newer version, which instead of the bluish mirror uh, finish, which is what I have, they have the now smoky gray. And then, uh, obviously, you need a display panel. Uh, I've worked with Top Foison. Great little panel. It's a 25, uh, 60 by 1440 uh, IPX, or IPX, um, IPS screen um, with, it, I mean, you can get it with or without the HDMI MIPI panel. It's neat. It's very compact. Literally can fold over to the back and make a full compact unit. And it has an aluminum backing, so it kind of supports the glass very important and then all you have to do is build a small case or as what I did bringing it back up I just kind of filled it into the slot let me go back to my main screen here uh, just essentially put it in the slot that normally goes for the phone um, used uh, a little bit of uh, what did I use here um, not masking tape but now I forgot it gaffers tape in order to hold it in place I added a uh, some foam backing uh, to prevent it from being scratched back here and uh, it's been pretty secure and then uh, basically an adapter to be able to run HDMI micro USB and then the structure sensor itself uh, runs off USB-C so the whole cost eventually will be about five hundred dollars um, so how does this compare to some of the other devices out there uh, we'll see so again, this device, uh, the company from, I think it's Hero Technology, and then the Structure Core is what makes up 
this device and uh, you could probably build this on your own for about 500 uh, if you could get the structure sensor for about that price right now it's only available in engineering quantity for a much higher price but that will come down and so we'll be able to build $500 AR headsets all right, so on to the next item. You may have heard of this. The Vive wireless adapter will be available pre-order 9.5, which is kind of cool. Um, so if you do have an HTC Vive headset, you probably want to get this for, uh, it looks like $300. I don't know. I think, I guess I'm going to be staying up to make sure I get one. Um, but the, the cool thing is this has a 6 meter by 6 meter range, uh, which should be more than sufficient uh, for most systems. And then if you have the version 2 Lighthouses and the new Pro headset, um, clearly this, uh, this system here leaves a little bit to be desired. But I saw a video where a guy had a room that was 30 by 30 and running around it instead of work fabulously. I don't know if that's true. Uh, if it is, it appears that 6 meter by 6 meter is either the nominal range or the low end. And you could probably push it, but again, I don't think if you've got a scene with a lot of information in it, uh, which would probably push the compression and bandwidth on, that it would keep up with it. Um, I don't know if he was just testing it. He's a developer of uh, Tilt Brush. So if I remember in the Tilt Brush experience, um, you had a dark background, so the uh, not a lot of information going on at the time. So who knows? All right, so... There you go. It's the Vive Wireless. And then uh, another update. Uh, if you're familiar, I've talked about the Breckel uh, affordable motion capture system. And uh, clearly, it's extremely affordable. So if you've got a Connect, Connect version 2, oh, and, and now I guess he supports the Orbitec uh, sensors. And then in the future, it appears he'll be supporting OpenNI, uh, which then opens it up to a ton of uh, Chinese as well as other OEM uh, structure sensor type cameras. I personally have been looking at the uh, using the Connect 2s because, or the Connect 1 depending on which one to call it or the Connect for the Xbox One. But the uh, the Xbox One I think is a much better uh, camera. It uses time of flight so I feel the uh, skeleton tracking is more accurate. Um, but he has come out with something that I thought was extremely uh, interesting and that's version 3 and let me go ahead and bring these up on the screen and here's a version 3 uh, the actual I thought the uh, user interface seemed a little cleaner but what's most important about the uh, this particular version is that you can now fuse multiple sensors either the version 2 of the Kinect or uh, the version 1 of the Kinect and you can have multiple units. I think it's up to 12 of them. Uh, the thing about the version 2 is that basically it's one uh, Connect version 2 per machine. Um, but I have been able to test this with a $300, $350 Nook. You still have to supply memory and hard drive. But so it's about $500 uh, connected to uh, one of the uh, Connect version 2 provides a remote head. And you need three of these in order to do a full 360. So probably in two weeks, I'll be able to give a live demonstration. But the cool thing about that is that you'll be able to essentially do full motion capture uh, all, all parts of your body, depending on regardless of how you turn or move. And that, I think, is very cool. If you notice um, some previous uh, examples I've given, if you kind of move your body to the side, which then obscures... Uh, one of your arms, you lose tracking of it, and it clearly shows. I also notice in version 3 that the tracking seems more solid, more stable, less jitter in the feet. Uh, if you noticed in my Vince uh, example where I used uh, the uh, Breco motion capture, I had a lot of jitter in my feet. Again, that could be because I was using default settings and didn't clean them up. But out of the box, I felt the experience here was much better. And then uh, here's a little video of it in operation. As you can see, here I am uh, moving. Uh, I asked him about the problem is, yeah, see, as I turn sideways, I lose tracking of one of my arms. Uh, he uh, resamples at 60 frames per second, but sadly, none of the sensors that I know of that are either supported or out there right now do more than 30 frames per second. 
which is good for a lot of motion, uh, slow motion. But as you can see here, I'm not moving, moving fairly quick and it seems to be working fine. Um, so this is in version three. And then another fun little thing uh, that uh, he has now provided in version two. So if you already have version two, you should probably get the latest upgrade. If you work in Unreal, he has now um, made it compatible with uh, LiveLink, which is the tool that uh, they've shown examples being used with Maya. But you can actually cause your uh, your animations or your skeletons uh, within, and he actually supplies one. And I found uh, I'd have to make a custom version of the mannequin in order for it to work, but or just use the skeleton he provides and then just do a, a conversion to the mannequin, which worked okay. And you can see uh, in this video that I have um, that it worked okay. So the initial one is because I'm just getting into the camera. And there you go. I'm moving back and forth in it. And there's a little bit of floating, as you can see on the mannequin character. You can't see behind me. But his um, skeleton seems to work pretty well. Um, I didn't do anything to tweak the mannequin, but as you can see, it follows a lot of the same animation. And again, as you can see, as I turn sideways, I lose tracking of an arm. So again, I'll come back later on and test it in full 360, which should resolve that. But the cool thing is I was able not only to provide real-time tracking within Unreal, but uh, also set it up so that I had, you know, there's another example out there, but I was able to attach a camera and my HTC, me, HTC Vive headset to it and be able to have a body now, which I thought was kind of fun without having to use uh, the Vive tracker. Um, so I thought that's kind of neat. The same thing can be done with a Unity plugin, and he has a couple of demos for that. I had run into some issues with this because, let's see if I can show it again. Um, let's go back to this. Uh, over on the right-hand side, if you zoom in, um, he has the ability to stream this live over uh, multiple ways. One is the uh, live link we just talked about for Unreal. Another one is basically using either an FTP I'm not FTP, a uh, TCP IP or a UTP or UDP um, protocol in order to stream information. I tried doing that in the version 3 and ran into problems. We finally realized uh, with the version 3 as it stands, because it is in beta, I needed more than one sensor. And sadly, at this point, I only have one sensor. Later on, I will have two. Um, so it didn't actually allow the uh, data to be streamed. Uh, so I went back to version 2, everything worked fine, so when I get my second um, uh, Connect 2, this should be alleviated and I'll be able to give some interesting um, animation examples where I have much more, uh, uh, what do you want to call it, resolvement of my motions because I will have cameras all the way around me. So looking forward to that. Okay, so let's see, where are we at now? Let's get into some of the news items because... Uh, some of these are kind of neat. Well, one thing that uh, a lot of people have been bringing up is uh, this ray tracing functionality that's going to be built into uh, the new uh, NVIDIA uh, processors, the Quattro RTX and then what is it, the RTS um, for the consumer market. Uh, we'll now be able to do real-time, um, what do you want to call it, ray tracing. Well, we'll see about that if it's going to be real time. Some people feel that it's not going to be everything that we expect it to be. And some of the examples and videos that we've shown before uh, were only possible because you had uh, these very sophisticated multi-card uh, versions of this, which cost tens of thousands of dollars. And in fact, I think the Quattro version of the uh, Quattro RTX is like 10000 but the pricing on the consumer version, I don't know if they have it in here. Um, here, here's, I'll throw a little clip in there. Used in the Unreal Engine, which they develop it. But again, this was done in real time with a very beefy, I think it was $50,000, $60,000 system. Will we be able to get that? No, but we should be able to see some um, 
principles of ray tracing, maybe just in objects that are ray traced. So we could probably switch between them. So the cool thing is that we'll be able to get the RTX uh, 2070 for about $500 with the 2880 Ti going up to 1199 but there is an intermediate model, the 2080, that I think is 799 So it's going to be, I mean, reasonably priced uh, uh, for what you would call this, but a $500 2070 what did I pay for my 1070s? 350, 400. So it's a little more expensive, but having uh, this new technology, I think, uh, I think will be worth it. We'll see. Um, but this is kind of an interesting article. If it's important, they think it is. I think it is. So look into it. Okay, on to the next item. I thought this was very cool from a 3D fabrication perspective. Imagine having an SLA printer that can print graphene. That's essentially what they've done here. Uh, they were able to use a polymer uh, that was hardened by, I guess, UV uh, that uh, basically uh, supported um, graphene, uh, what do you call it, molecules in this lattice and then uh, once they formed it into a 3D pattern uh, they were able to then burn out the polymer and just have the graphene supported by these, what do they call it here? Um, yeah, I see the rigid uh, acrylate uh, polymer and then uh, when the furnace burns it off it leaves them into a pure graphene aerogel, which they define as being kind of like an air bubble uh, that continues to support it. So I thought that was kind of neat and uh, look forward to possibly having this in the future of consumer uh, grade. Uh, you know, for, that'll be an, another uh, material that uh, Form Labs will have, which will be a graphene uh, polymer based uh, material. So looking forward to that. Obviously, it's in its infancy right now. All right, let's move on to the next one. Actually, here's another one showing the graphene object on a flower. And it talks a little bit more about that. Links will be in the show notes. All right, on to uh, 3D and medicine. Again, another area where we're using lattice, in this case, ceramic scaffolding. And this isn't the first time that we've heard this. You remember, uh, I've talked about this. There was a either Australian or New Zealand uh, researcher who had come up with something very similar and actually has worked in Beijing uh, University in order to move forward with it. Uh, I don't know where she's at. Um, I can reach out to her. I have her email. But it looks like something in the United States very similar. Uh, so they do talk about uh, the process, but essentially they create a lattice and then put it in, uh, and they use it on obviously uh, test animals, but uh, they put it uh, where the bone should be. Uh, the bone grew through the lattice, provided support, and then eventually dissolved, providing uh, a bone structure very uh, similar and with the same strength as the original bone, which I thought was very interesting. Um, clearly, the lattice system would have to be designed and printed beforehand and then inserted. Um, so in the case of where you have internal structures, uh, like in the case of my wife, uh, the upper orbital roof um, that was reached through her eye socket, uh, you would need kind of a, a ship in a bottle type technique. Um, but if you had done a, a standard uh, craniotomy uh, where they lift the brain, then you would have access to it and you could build this mesh. Uh, now, again, there are some probable um, limitations to this, how much of the bone can be removed before the bone will grow through it, um, that's unknown. Uh, but clearly this would be something important uh, where we're actually using bone instead of replacing it with uh, titanium or other synthetic materials uh, that degrade over time and have to be replaced. So uh, again, lots of uh, work being done in these areas and it's slowly, I wouldn't say slowly, obviously it's very fast if we're looking at it in real time, it seems slow, but we're seeing a lot of progress. And again, I'll reach out to the researcher uh, from Australia and see where she's at with her uh, research. And uh, I think I've read something before that she's basically moved in the same uh, testing 
uh, and who knows, they may actually be doing human testing by now. So we'll get into that later. Okay, so let's move on to, uh, let's see where we're at, uh, scanners. So if you uh, live in Austria, you're probably already familiar with this, but this is a company called 3D Copy Systems out of Austria. And essentially it's a photogrammetry system using DLSRs. We've, not, we've heard this before, but it seems a lot more uh, clean, organized, um, that you can purchase. And here, yeah, now that you can see it, if you look at this image here, you can see where they s they're on rollers, but you slide the two sides back into place once your characters are, or subjects are in place. And then um, basically probably from an external camera view it and then take the snapshots. And then I guess they're coming out with a little Alice version uh, where the big Alice is 64, the little Alice is 36 cameras. I don't know exactly, now that they say 36, I thought it said 8, but 30, that makes sense. So essentially, what is that, uh, what did I come up with, 2, so 13 uh, layers with 2 cameras apiece uh, versus, in this one it has 4 cameras apiece, but a much smaller space, or was it 3 cameras, oh well, yeah, maybe it was 3, so that would be 12. So three cameras instead of four cameras, and only 12 of them uh, instead of, um, I can't remember exactly how many around, but, uh, but again, with a smaller confined space, uh, you would need as many cameras, and so more than likely it'll be cheaper. Uh, no pricing, you'll have to contact them. Uh, but I thought this uh, product called the Griffin was interesting. Let's see. And essentially it is a, an automated camera mount that tilts and positions your camera, and I don't know if you have to go to different locations in the room, but takes multiple images so that you can provide these multiple images into a photogrammetry software system and have them compile those images to create uh, high resolution 3D objects with textures. And here's an example, I'll bring it full screen. So unknown what the cost would be for something like this, but clearly with this kind of definition, uh, very interesting. Obviously, you supply your own DLSR, and supposedly it works with multiple units. Um, but that looked very interesting, so I was not aware that they uh, had something like that. So I'm going to reach out to them and find out what they cost, because sadly, none of the pricing is identified here. But uh, it will be in the show notes, so if you're interested in something like that, reach out yourself. Okay, so where are we at now? So this is an interesting article. Um, this is from V-Square, and they kind of talk about their experience with Unreal and AR. Now, I have not done anything in AR with Unreal, especially in the early time, but they used AR Kit. And, uh, and one of the things with you're using on a PC and AR Kit, there was some hoops that you had to jump through. Supposedly, it's a little easier to work with, but I didn't decide to move in that area since I already had a full environment on the Mac side. <clears throat> so essentially you have to make a decision on AR Car AR Kit, and then they talk about uh, lighting, and they talk about how if you basically have single lighting in there, uh, it can appear flat, which I agree with. So one of the things that I learned early on that they talk about as well is you essentially, they call it emissive in Unreal, which is their term for it, but essentially an unlit scene. Uh, using emissive properties so that it illuminates regardless if there's any lighting. But then you bake in all your lighting in, I think they used Maya, but there are plenty of tools. Blender has some baking tools as well. And then I guess there's a plug-in to make it even easier. Uh, I've used uh, a couple of other products uh, to do this as well. So you bake in your lighting and your shadowing, and then you bring it back in, and that gives you that uh, shadow quality. Uh, you can also bring in... Uh, Jeez, I can't think of the word now. Some of the other features uh, that the name is escaping me. But you do all this beforehand, so I would agree with them. And, uh, and then you just bring it back in. And some of my models, like Vince, uh, I use something similar with. Bake in your, your shadows, and then it looks a lot more realistic without requiring a lot of uh, processor time. So you can read that article to get a little more information on it. Um, but I do agree with them. I don't know if they had a demo in here. They don't seem to of uh, 
their own product, but I guess you can go out and now find that out for yourself. Uh, to what this, right, so the main now, topic is on this, and that, or at least in the uh, 3D tech closet, and that's the Zoom H2N. This is a, it's actually won awards, the workhorse of field recorders. It's small, lightweight. It's been around for a few years now, I think about three years. Um, but what made this uh, kind of an essential tool, especially for people wanting to capture 3D audio, is the fact is that it had five built-in microphones that could now con basically create AmbiX recordings. And here they actually look at some of the features. Here are your five, which allows you uh, uh, multiple patterns. Here's a two-channel um, omnidirectional, four-channel element, XY, or an MS pattern. Well, which you could use for, let's say, uh, if you're like as a, a mic for doing a podcast. Uh, Two-channel, omnidirectional, allows you to capture the full room. Four-channel was the precursor to their AMBX, but provide four channels. Um, so you would have basically elements um, separated and be able to get left, right, rear, left, and right. And I played with that before, and it's kind of cool. But the important thing is, is this new, uh, here's your surround sound, spatial audio for VR. So they have essentially taken these microphones and created uh, spatial recording. And I have a little video that I'll go ahead and show off. Hi, everyone. This is John from Zoom, and I'm here to show you how to use the Zoom H2N to record spatial audio for virtual reality videos. The H2N is the only portable recorder with five built-in microphones and four different recording modes, XY, mid-side, two-channel, and four-channel surround. The H2N's four-channel surround mode allows you to record spatial audio files which are compatible with Google's Jump VR platform. Spatial audio, which is also natively compatible with YouTube, allows manipulation of your recorded audio to let you virtually move through a three-dimensional space with realistic sound. You can specify the positions of sound as well as characteristics of the environment. This creates an immersive visual and auditory VR experience, allowing viewers to experience a directional sound as they move through the video. The H2N's multiple onboard microphones allow for an accurate 360-degree image. To create videos for the platform, Google has created a specialized jump camera rig consisting of 16 camera modules organized in a circular array. When deployed as part of the jump camera rig, the H2N sits in the center of the circular multi-camera array, making its compact size an essential feature. To access the spatial audio format, press Menu, go to Record, select Spatial Audio, and turn it on. The H2N will monitor and playback in standard mid-side mode, however it will create a single four-channel multi-track audio file with left-right, front-back, and omni-tracks encoded to spatial audio format. Once your 3D audio is paired with video, this will result in a lifelike virtual reality environment. For more information and product updates... Okay, so what's important about that is that you have essentially two patterns, front, rear, left, right, and then an omnidirectional. What you don't have with it to complete the full AMBX uh, first order is you don't have something up down. Uh, so there are ways to get around that. You could have a directional mic or a cardioid mic that provides your up. Um, down may not be as important, especially if you're on the ground, but if you're trying to track something that's in like a ball going up and down, that might be important. Uh, so you could get by with this unit plus a separate um, mic that's pointed up. Uh, I think there is a, an adaption to the H2N that provides that capability. But if you don't need that, you just want to capture spatial audio for your game uh, for Unity uh, 360 or insert into a video, um, this is a great way to start. Um, it's inexpensive, it's about 250 maybe even a little cheaper now. And you can support multiple techniques as far as recording. So there's some instructions um, that you can go out to their site that talk about how to set it up. And then what we'll do is we'll go through this and then we'll talk about um, what you can do on the unit itself. I'll pull it out here in a second. 
So essentially to uh, fulfill the YouTube specification, first order Ambisonic, AC and channeling order, which it all supports. Uh, it says it supports, it requires AAC encoding, um, and then MO values require AAC encoding, but what you would do here, since it doesn't provide an AAC, you essentially um, sample this thing um, at one WAV file, I would suggest probably um, either 48 or 96 bits per second. And I think it does, um, I want to say 10, even 16. I can't remember now. But you should have basically all the capability in order for it to work. It says best quality use PCM or WAV format. And then once you have this completed, uh, what I have done in the past is just get yourself a FM MPEG and essentially insert this audio channel uh, as your main channels uh, replacing whatever video that you or audio that you had recorded at the time of your 360 video and there you go and then you basically use the uh, YouTube encoder uh, essentially it adds the proper meta code or you can throw this into Premiere and it will take care of it as well it will see it as a full ambisonic 4 channel and then I'll actually push it back out properly as well so then it says create a 360 spatial upload and then use the metadata tool. So if you get this unit, go out there. Um, this is a good place to start. Um, like I said, record it. Um, use something like FMMPEG in order to um, drop it into the MP4 that you created with your 360 camera. And then uh, use the meta tool to add the meta information for YouTube and then you can upload it. And I've done that several times. Uh, if you go through some of my earlier videos, you can see where I've used AMBX. Works pretty good. Um, I haven't done any dramatic definitions of it, but some other people have. Um, so work with that. And then there's one other uh, video that talk about uh, what you can use. Yeah, basically it's very similar to what we just brought up. Okay, and that's for computer, and then I guess it says Android. Um, I don't think there is an Android tool to do this. So the other thing is, and they don't really mention it here, and we're going to talk about that later, there are some tools out there um, that are either free or low cost uh, that will help you do that, and we'll kind of talk about that later. But for now, let's go back and... Mm, find my main screen, which is there it is. Okay, so this is the product that I created. So essentially, this is a Insta 360 one on top of basically a low cost selfie monopole that I have mounted to a case that I've designed. This is uh, printed at Shapeways, so it's a nice clean nylon SLS. So it's fairly uh, well rigid and firm and obviously clear access to everything except one area um, that I will have to work around but isn't a problem once you're all set up and that is access to the menus. But we're going to go ahead and take off the upper uh, panel here and it just kind of snaps off maybe. One of the things that uh, I'll have to go back in and design a little bit is that uh, one of the things that I found in Fusion 360 is that when you do subtractive, it doesn't allow you an offset, so you have to go back in later on. And I guess I had forgotten to do that, so it's actually really tight. So I sanded it down a little bit, so if you're wanting to go out in Shapeways and get this, I'd hold off until I could finish um, redoing that uh, one, the upper piece, uh, so that it uh, has a little bit more clearance. Okay, so there's your lower piece. Uh, essentially has a location to you put a, like a um, one quarter bolt in it, and then uh, that allows you to screw in a monopod like I have here. And then there's another location to put in a one quarter thread, uh, tripod type thread to hold this in place, as you see here. 
And as you can see, you have access pretty much to all your controls, even the menu once you take the top off, so, and the power button. So I will turn it on. And it takes a, a few seconds, depending on how large your SD card is. And then I already have it set up for um, spatial. And as you saw in the previous video, you go to menu. And then uh, essentially, oops, menu. And then you select there your input type. And then from there, Uh, let's see, I don't have a pin. We'll do this. That's We'll take it all the way off and you can see. Okay, so. So let's go to record. And then you can identify your record format. And here I have 48 kHz, 24-bit, but you could probably just use 16-bit. Uh, but obviously it provides a nice dynamic range um, that you can then put together. And then if you wanted to convert it to 16-bit, you're welcome to do that. Uh, and when you're completed with that, hit the menu button. And then you can just go down, keep going down. Oops, one more up. Go to input. And something else that I just found out is that you can hook this up as a USB device and actually get AMBX through USB. So it can work in real time if you upgrade to version three. Um, so here are some features. And then as mentioned up here is where you control your pattern. I have it on four channel, which is necessary. And then you just basically rotate this to your channel selection uh, right up here to four channel. And that should be it. And just keep hitting the menu button until you're back to spatial audio. And then it shows your omni channel, shows you your left, right, and your front, back. And so, I mean, obviously I can record right now by pressing the record button, which is down here. Your mic um, gain is off. It's a little turn wheel. You can just adjust it. There, we adjust it all the way down so we don't have any uh, volume. But as we turn it up, uh, we have more. But keep in mind uh, that also increases the gain, so it also increases the ambient noise. So you might want to keep that in mind. And as you can see, um, it is adjusting. Oh, let's bring it up closer. Hello. 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 So once it records all this, and I'll hit the record button, and as you can see, in order to identify, the red light comes on, identifying record up on top, which is still visible with the top on. And also, um, you should see the counter. Uh, oops, there's too much glare. Let's see if I can. There we go. Um, you can see the counter incrementing as well on the number of seconds. 
and just let it run. I found that this thing is capable of recording uh, with a good fresh um, pair of alkalines, uh, geez, eight hours. So if you put in a large uh, card, you can have this thing for record for a while. So there's a couple of ways um, to gain access. Sadly, the USB card is below, so you'll have to remove it from the case. But if you're not using a case, it's fairly easy. Or you can uh, attach a micro USB, actually it's a standard mini or USB connection here, and uh, run that into your computer, and then it will act like an SD card. Or, as mentioned, you could use this as a, as a podcast mic, uh, depending on this. And now you can actually use this as an AMBX mic, uh, depending on if you have a DAW that's capable of bringing in four channels in real time, uh, which could be very cool uh, to be able to do a live AMBX uh, recording with 360. Uh, it's something I'll have to explore in the future, but the fact that it's available. And so, with that, um, I'll put this back together. And a uh, nice little cage to protect it, mounted on another monopod, and uh, with the camera on top. Hit record, hit record on your 360. In fact, I think the Zoom has either a wired, yeah, I think it's a wired remote, yeah, there's a little thing. I don't know if they have a Bluetooth type. Um, so you could control it wired uh, remotely, but uh, I don't think there's a Bluetooth component, which I think would be kind of neat. Then you could run this with the uh, your camera in order to support this up here as well and have them both go on at the same time. Otherwise, just use an audio cue, clap your hands, or if you've got a clapboard, uh, so that way you can synchronize the sound for later on. Uh, if you're only exploring ambient sound, uh, that would be good. And I believe the this particular camera here is a, is a front and rear, uh, but it does not support AMBX, so you could possibly combine this in your DAW with the AMBX in order to provide an up-down channel, possibly, along with this. Um, or you could use a whole other mic uh, and then again bring in this into something like Reaper and the uh, 3D audio tools from Facebook which are free uh, combine them all in order to create a full uh, 360 sound field or yeah 360 3D audio sound field so what good is this well if you're out in the field like I have been and I'm trying to create realistic settings you could put this out there let's say at dusk dawn where you're having minimal human traffic. Um, you could capture sounds from the forest, lakes, whatever, and then bring that back in to create a more realistic ambient experience um, that would modify based upon how you changed your, your head movement. So if you had, let's say, an animal that was um, walking through the brush off to one side, uh, clearly that would show up if it's loud enough uh, in your headset and you'd be able to basically get the feeling that there are things alive around you. Same thing with the rustling of the trees and um, just a more full embodied sound. Uh, I use this to um, go to a our nearby creek and was able to um, look at the audio or not look at um, record the sounds of the creek, the water um, as well as other sounds in the area, and it seems extremely realistic. Uh, so it's a great little tool, and uh, next week, or in two weeks, we're going to go ahead and, and pull out the SD card um, with some samples that I've done before, and then bring that in uh, to the Reaper um, DAW, as well as uh, the spatialization tools from Facebook in order to create a sound field and a file that we can then put bring into Unreal and Audio or Unreal and Unity in later episodes. Okay, well that's about it for today. And uh, on that note, I will. In fact, I should have hooked this up, but maybe uh, in the next episode I'll have this hooked up so you maybe possibly able to experience it online. But on that note, um, enjoy your weekend, and I will see you in two weeks. Bye.